Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Joshua chapter 4. I'm going to do the next lesson in our series on uh, memorial stones. We've been uh, just simply talking about the history of our church and our uh, fellowship. Uh, we began with uh, just telling the story of my parents and their salvation early ministry, and now we're leading up to them coming here to uh, Prescott. Let's get our main verse, Joshua 4, 4 through 7, tells us why God wants us to remember. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a, mem a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, so this text uh, tells God wanted them to build a memorial. These memorial stones are something that they could look at to line up with in the future. So that is what we're doing. We're looking at our history, and that uh, helps us to understand whether we're uh, staying on track. So we're now up to... Uh, the early Prescott days and the beginnings of the Jesus movement. That's where we're going to start today. I have given in uh, at least two of the lessons, maybe all three previous ones, we've given a repeated lesson that is not just about our history. It is actually uh, affects your life. And that lesson is God is in control. That, that is a powerful lesson. God is in control in life. He doesn't just watch. God is not just an observer. He orchestrates. He arranges things. God makes plans. That is what the Bible tells us for every person, uh, for every church. There are specific things that he wants to, to happen with specific people in specific ways. Acts 9 verse 15 this is the New Century Version. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, I have chosen Saul for an important work. He must tell about me to those who are not Jews, to kings, and to the people of Israel. Okay, so this is God saying, I have chosen Saul for an important work. And so that is uh, uh, destiny, that is God's plans. All right, but here's the point I, I want to make to you right now. The will of God is not a perfectly straight line. It is not like God tells you something here, this is where you should be, and you make a perfectly straight line and you reach the will of God from revealing to fulfillment. The, the story of our church and our fellowship with my parents, I have shared with you, this is why I didn't just start with Prescott, my parents' story of the will of God was actually one of frustration, of starts and stops. I've told you about problems and disappointment. I've told you that my father and his ministry were very frustrated with not seeing genuine conversions in early ministry and frustration with the structure that he was working with, not having support. And so it wasn't a perfect perfectly straight line. I, I told you how he quit the ministry uh, for a time. When you are dealing with problems and frustrations, you can come to wrong conclusions, as my father did on several uh, occasions. The, the wrong conclusions that you can come to is, God doesn't care about me. If he told me to do something, but somehow it seems to be going backwards or things going wrong. It's like, God, don't you care? If you cared, you would make it point A to point B in a perfectly straight line. That's, that's wrong. Or when you're battling with frustrations, you can come to the conclusion that I don't have what it takes. Yes, God did speak. Yes, he does have a plan, but apparently I can't do it. I'm, I don't have 
what it takes. All right, this is, this is a very powerful lesson here. God moves, when he plans something, he moves on parallel tracks. In other words, in your life, you may be dealing with a frustration and all you are seeing is you. But at the exact same time that you are dealing with what you're dealing with, God is working his will on a parallel track. I told you last week we ended with uh, my parents went to Carson, California. They were only there for 90 days. Now, several numbers of years of frustration are coming to a head. He took over a church where the previous uh, pastor was a woman who retired, stayed in the church. There were seven other uh, licensed female pastors in the church. And so, dad is now absolutely coming to the end of himself, this is not gonna work. He is one month in to what's only gonna be a 90 day uh, tenure there, and he is growing increasingly frustrated. All these things now, God, don't you care? Why would you put me in this position? God, apparently I don't have what it takes. All right, at the exact same time, in Prescott, Arizona, in the Foursquare Gospel Church, the, it came out that the pastor of the church was committing adultery with a woman in the church. His son was also committing adultery with a woman in the church, and both of them ran off with these ladies. Okay, this is happening. My father has no idea about this. Because when God is working his will, he doesn't tell you what he's doing everywhere in the world. Right? My dad didn't say, Wayman, look, I know you're frustrated, but don't worry. In another place, my dad has no idea. All he's dealing with is what's happening here. The pastor runs off. And so the church here in Prescott had no pastor. For over two months, they had no pastor. They just brought in visiting speakers for over two months. So two months go by, and my dad absolutely had enough. That's it. He resigned. He called up his supervisor, just letting you know that I have resigned the church. And the man said, you should wait and think and pray about this. And he said, it's too late. I've already handed in my resignation. I've handed in the keys, and as my parents had discussed, dad's conclusion was, I don't have what it takes. I don't know how to work in the, the system, so we are going to leave the ministry. Let's just go find a place where we can raise the kids, and they decided California was not where they wanted to do that. The man asked him, didn't you say you're from Prescott, Arizona? My dad moved to Prescott from Arkansas when he was five years old. And uh, his early years were here. And he said, yeah, that's where I'm from. He said, before you quit altogether, the church in Prescott doesn't have a pastor. So he said, why don't you, before you quit, why don't you just go and have a look? It was coming up to Christmas time. They were already planning on coming. Their family was in Phoenix. They were already planning on coming to Phoenix. So they said, yeah, okay, we'll do that. And uh, we will uh, go look at it. Okay. So, but I want you to see this parallel at the same time. And that's true for you. You are perhaps battling a frustration here. But at the same time, God is working his will. That is always what he does. All right, now here is a very powerful lesson that affects every one of you, and that is the power of people. I'm telling you this story, and of, of course this story is, uh, uh, involves uh, my father who is the pastor. A church is led by a pastor, but a church is actually a gathering of people. And God has plans for people not just the pastor. Jeremiah 29, 11, this is the New Living Translation. 
For I know the work plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Okay, this is God speaking actually to all people. And he says, I have plans for you. Plans. There are things that God intends. One of the things that God plans for people, he plans for people to be in churches. Okay, the, the problem in modern Christianity is people shop for churches like they shop for everything else. They think it's just personal preference. Oh, how is the, the singing there? What are the kids' programs here? What is the building? Are the seats cushy enough? What, you know, on and on and on. And then they come, and uh, I will come here based solely on, in the same way that I would choose a restaurant or any other commodity in life, or you have people who, I'll go to this church in the morning and that church at night, and on Wednesday I'll go to this church. That's unbiblical. God plans for people to be in churches. One of the scriptures that speaks about being rooted and planted. If you have plants at home, Pluck them up today, put them in another pot tonight, put them in another pot on Wednesday, see how that works for you. It doesn't work for plants, it doesn't work for people either. So and I'll, just, I'll just pause here. If, if you are visiting and you come from a church, that's, that's fine. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm fine with you coming and, and I think it's wonderful that you even consider our church. But wherever you go, you should plant yourself. If it's not going to be here, then wherever you're going to go, plant yourself. Because, and the crucial factor is what does God want? I want you to put up a picture here. And now this is a powerful part of our story. In the church, you see here uh, on either side, this is Bob and Sharon Allen. Young Bob and Sharon. I didn't have a uh, young picture in the middle. This is Dale and Barb Copeland. Barb and Bob, their brother and sister. Okay. Now, here they are living in Iowa, and the parents bought a lot in Prescott Valley before the internet. There were people, they had drawings, and they would go to shopping centers in the Midwest that's why there's a place called Lakeshore Drive. They would tell their people that, oh, there's a lake there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Based on a drawing, they would have people buy land in Prescott Valley. And so the parents bought a lot in Prescott Valley. And so Dale and Barb, that couple in the middle, they drove out to help them check out what did you buy sight unseen and when they came, for some reason, they liked it so much, they bought a house. And Dale and Barb decided to stay, and they called their family, Bob and Sharon, and they said, guess what? We bought a house. We're moving to Prescott Valley. If I remember right, there were only, uh, I, I think Robert Road was four blocks long, if I remember right. There were 11 houses then. And they bought, and so Bob and Sharon helped them drive, because they're going to move, they drove Barb, Dale had already gone with one of the girls, and they drove with some of the kids to help them come to this place where they are going to start a new life. And when they did, on their way back, they passed through Phoenix and stopped, they had a sales office, the sales office for this place called Prescott Valley was in Phoenix, and they stopped in and they bought a house too. So now Bob and Sharon moved here. These couples moved here, and because they attended the Foursquare Church where they're from in Iowa, they started attending the Foursquare Church that's on Lincoln Street back then in Prescott, Arizona. They're in the church for seven months, and the pastor and his son run off with ladies, they're committing adultery. They've been in the church for seven months. 
Two months without a pastor, immediately when they came, uh, Sharon, they immediately put her on the organ. Bob immediately became a council member. Bob became a council member right after Noah got off the ark. He's been <laughs> forever. Okay. So think about this. They are now here. My parents now, we're going to go look at the church in Prescott, but in actual fact, they were leaning more strongly to Let's just quit the ministry, find a place, and raise the kids. But someone told them in the interim when they're visiting and filling in, they said, the church is small, but there are two young couples. I can't remember if I remember right. Bob and Sharon, I think Bob said he was 26 or 27. Sharon was like 23, uh, 24 years old and uh, the Copelands would be somewhere in that range. And so my parents talked among themselves, said, what do you think? So they made an agreement, and they put a fleece before God. You know that thing that Gideon did? And this is what they said. They said, God, if those two young couples will stay in the church, we'll take the church. But if they're going to leave... And think about this. You've only been in the church seven months and the pastor's committing adultery? Does that make you feel warm and fuzzy about that church? Like, wow, what a great church. Pastor and his son are both adulterous. And my parents prayed and said, if they will stay, then we will take the church. They somehow heard that Uh, Barb Copeland and Sharon Allen both worked at the Prescott Valley Motel Cafe. Here, next picture. You will see that sign. There was a cafe in front. Actually, they built the cafe for people who were coming to check out the land. They'd put them up in a hotel for three days and feed them meals. That's actually why the cafe originally existed. Barb and Sharon both worked there as waitresses. And Dad somehow was told that they worked And so my parents went to see them at the cafe. When they got there, Sharon wasn't on shift at that time. Only Barb Copeland was there. And Dad said to them, we are thinking of taking the church and ask them, we hear that you and your uh, uh, in-laws are, I mean, your uh, relatives or the Allens are uh, in the church If we came here, would you stay in the church? Think about this. What if they said no? If we come, will you stay? They don't know my parents. They don't know anything about their ministry. I asked Sharon about this. She she seemed to think that Barb wasn't terribly enthusiastic, but apparently she said yes well enough that my parents said, all right, we'll take the church. Okay, here's my point that I want to make. The decisions of people who simply want to do right. Wouldn't it be nice if every, every decision came with an angelic visitation and music and bright lights? Wouldn't it have been nice if an angel would have come down and said, Barb, it's the Lord, do it. But that's not what happens. You are simply living your life. If you want to live for God and there's something in you that you just want to do right, God guides you. But listen, the choices you make have powerful impact. You understand that? What people do, that's why it matters whether you come to church. It matters whether you pray. Never think what I do is not important. Think about that you should thank Bob and Sharon Allen. Some of you, you owe your salvation because they simply made a choice. We're going to do right. God put us here and we're going to do right. That is a powerful lesson of people power. Exodus 1, 20 and 21. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was, because the midwives feared God, that he provided households for them. 
You'll find stories like this in the Bible. Here are midwives, you know the story there, Pharaoh made a decree, all male children are to be killed, but they said, we're going to do right. We just want to do right before God. That's not right. And because they said we want to do right, a baby boy named Moses was born and became a deliverer. My point is, any of you, if you knew my father and you think that he was a tremendous man, he could not do what he did without all of you. That's the power of people. I am now the pastor. I cannot do the will of God without you. Please never think, you know, what am I doing here? What's my role? I must not be important. If you want to do right, there is wonderful power. So in January of 1970, my parents, we, we moved to Prescott, Arizona, and uh, in the church in Lincoln Street, they got a picture here. This is the original building. This building, I think, seated 65 people. Very small, 606 Lincoln uh, uh, Street. And so in the first service, there were 29 people, seven of which were the Mitchell family. Okay, so this is how God orchestrated his will because he has plans for churches, he has plans for pastors, he has plans for people. Okay, you can't understand our church and our history as a fellowship unless you understand the Jesus movement. Very, very important. In the 1960s, the early 70s were a time of incredible change in America. Just some, some pictures of there was unrest, there was protests, there were race riots, there were uh, anti-war uh, protests, national turmoil, the nation. There was, it was incredibly divided uh, uh, politically and uh, protests all across America, riots all across America, opposition to the Vietnam War and uh, civil rights and, and, uh, and so on. During that time, young people rebelled against conventions or against things that were the norms of society. They rebelled against marriage. They rebelled against work. They rebelled against uh, expectations of money. And there began to be the hippies. Uh, hippies were just young people. They had outward manifestations of rebellion, whether that was their hair, whether that was the way they dressed. Uh, uh, drugs began to be very, very widespread. And uh, there was uh, a great uh, wave of sexuality, promiscuity, all throughout America. But God began to move supernaturally among young people in America. And this is very, very important. Okay, we're going to talk about revival. Not a series of meetings. That is, you know, we call them revival meetings because we want people to be revived. It's not what I'm talking about. Nor is revival. Please never come and tell me how exciting it is that they're having revival in some place that basically is they're worshiping for a long time. That is not revival. Revival is only genuine when it results in widespread conversions. So what God began to do, this was a national revival. Young people who are rebelling at the same time began to have a hunger for spiritual things. Many of them that began to be Eastern religion. But interestingly, some of them were drawn. There was nothing in them that would normally draw them to church. But they began to be interested. People began to get saved supernaturally. This is one of the marks of revival. When there is a genuine or a national revival, normally you can always get people saved. I don't care what's going on in the world. That is normally connected always to personal witnessing and evangelism. In a national revival, God begins to move in supernatural ways. I, I recommend a, a book uh, to you. It's called God's Forever Family. This records the history of uh, the Jesus movement in the United States. And they have traced back uh, most of these kinds of revival scholars agree that 
the revival began with a couple in San Francisco, Ted and Elizabeth Wise. Uh, he, they were heavily involved in drugs. He was cheating on her very uh, immoral. She started going to a Baptist church and, uh, and got saved. And she began to tell these straight-laced Baptist conservative, you know, white people, pray for my husband, not understanding how out of his mind he was. And Ted resisted. He wanted nothing to do with it. While he was high on LSD, God dealt with him. This is what I say. When God is at work supernaturally, I'm not recommending LSD as an outreach tool, okay? <laughs> that is not the point. If you read God's Forever Family, like, wow, that's so... That is not the point. But he had an encounter with God. He said, God showed me a vision of the rat, and he said, the rat was me. And this is while he is stoned out of his mind on acid, and he has a conversion experience. Immediately, when people get saved, genuinely, they want to tell other people. So Ted Wise began telling all of their hippie drug friends about Jesus. They started getting saved. They would often, and again, I'm not recommending this, but they're, they're getting stoned reading the Bible. And some of them, God began to supernaturally save them. And uh, some of those that got saved, the hippies, they like to roam, they like to move, they like to hitchhike. Some of them would get saved and would move on. And again, because they were genuinely saved, everywhere they went, they started witnessing, spread from San Francisco down throughout Southern California, up into Oregon and Washington, and people began to get saved this was a move of God. This wasn't organized or planned. God was doing this. But one of the things that happened was, in that Baptist church, all of these strange creatures start coming into the church, and this caused turmoil. You got to imagine, they're straight-laced, white, conservative, middle-class people, and now these wild-looking people that take drugs and do all kinds of things over half of the members of the church left the church because hippies were coming to church and that offended them. How dare these dirty people be in our church? And how dare the pastor for letting these people come to our church? As a matter of fact, there came a point where they pressured the pastor, either you get rid of them or we'll get rid of you. Because that's how many churches are run. They're run by boards, councils, committees, and so he had to pressure these people to leave. That was very common. That was happening all across America. Young people, God would supernaturally bring them to churches of all kinds. They would start showing up in church not as a result of their direct outreach. God was drawing them, but because of the way they looked or smelled, or acted, the church would reject them. In our fellowship, we have a couple, Bob and Jenna Burris. They were originally saved in the Jesus movement in a Baptist church. I believe this was in Bullhead City. Bob was radically saved. He was a biker and a hippie. He began witnessing. Bob and Jenna started bringing all of their friends. They started all getting saved. This is in a Baptist church. More than 50 of their friends, all raw sinners, all got saved and started to come into church. But this was happening all across America. The people in the church were offended that these creatures, how dare you come and ruin our church and began to complain. And again, they put pressure on the pastor. You get rid of them or we get rid of you. And all of them, Bob and Jenna, more than 50 of his friends, they all backslid because they were not welcomed. And you know what's strange about that is I bet in those churches they were praying, oh God, send revival. And he did, and then when 
revival came, they said, get out of here. Not, what they were praying for is God, bring in people who look just like me. So now the Jesus movement comes to Prescott. There was a, a man living in Prescott named Ron Burrell. Ron Burrell was in a, a local band called Eden. They played uh, all over here in, in Prescott and, and in different places. Ron Burrell drove with four of his friends. Apparently there was a uh, a, a dope famine here. There was no, no drugs to buy here. So they had to go down near Sierra Vista to buy marijuana. They bought five pounds of marijuana. They stopped in the desert, all smoked. They're totally high. And on the way home to Prescott, they get in the car, they start driving, and they turn on the radio. Now, some of you are young, can't relate to this. AM radio, it used to be you had to be really close to the station in order to hear it. Because there in Sierra Vista, when they turn on the radio, there was a man very close to Sierra Vista named A.A. A. Allen, and his ministry was located there. And he would broadcast on the radio, A.A. A. Allen attracted lots of African Americans, and so his song service wasn't hymns. When they turned on the music, it had a beat, had some music, and they, they said, hey, this is pretty good. So they're listening to the music, they're like, this is pretty good, and then A.A. A. Allen started preaching. And the guys in the back seat said, turn that blankety-blank stuff off. But God was doing something supernatural in Ron's heart, and he said, no, I want to listen. The man driving was his cousin's husband, Jack Harris. And Jack said, no, man, that's cool if he wants to. Let's, let's listen. And so while stoned, he's listening to the preaching of the gospel, and God did something in his heart. And all of a sudden, he turned to Jack and he said, I'm not high anymore. God did a miracle in him. So when they get back to Prescott, Ron and his wife Susie, they decided they wanted to go to church. So his mom attended a local church. Back then it was called the, the Revival Center. And so Ron, Susie, and his half-brother, Walter Portugal, they all went to church. But the problem was they had long hair. i put a picture up here. Just want to show you a, a picture here. This is Walter Portugal in the middle. He had his Jesus hair there. And uh, I think this is later because Ron's hair is cut by that time. When they come to church, I don't even think Walter was saved. Immediately, the people started telling him, you have to cut your hair. Okay, and this is now to hippies. This is their identity. He's not even saved. You got to cut your hair. If you're going to come to church here, started putting great pressure on them. And so they said, that's... That's, uh, we're not into that. So they all left and didn't come back uh, uh, to church there. The band Eden, Ron and Walter, were in a band together, this band called Eden. They had just signed a recording contract. They were about to go in uh, later that day to record some songs. And they were in a park in Canto Park in Phoenix, Arizona, and Ron and Walter had acoustic guitars. They just started playing. And, and you know, in, in those days, young people were very attracted to music. Apparently, there was a crowd of several hundred people listening to them play. But God had told a young man who had been saved in the Jesus movement, I want you to go to Encanto Park. There are some musicians there, and I want you to give them a message from me. So here they are, they're playing, they're about to go in the recording studio. This is their dream of the band, and a man walks through the crowd, comes right up to them, and tells them, God told me to tell you, music is your God, you're bound by a spirit of music, you need to repent and live for me, and you're supposed to be playing music for me. They cussed him out. They didn't receive that. 
went on, recorded a couple of tracks, but God was moving on Ron Burl. He had had this encounter, and now God is moving on him. A short time later, they're playing a concert. They've recorded some tracks. They're about to release this, and God moved on him one night supernaturally. At the end of the concert, he told them, I quit. I'm out of the band. I can't do this anymore. Eden continued as a band. They kept playing. And uh, Ron and Susie, they started. Now they tried to go to church, and they're just hung up on your hair. So Ron and Susie start having Bible studies at their house and witnessing to everyone. And then he was also a very small town. People knew him from the band. Eden kept on as a band, and they arranged to play a concert outdoors up at Thumb Butte. And so Ron, he still owned half of the equipment. So he went up, took some of the people that he had witnessed to there, uh, saved. They went up to the concert, started witnessing to people while the concert's going on. He went up to Walter and said, when you guys take a break, can I sing a couple of songs? Because now he started writing songs for Jesus, and they played as long as they could to keep him from doing that, but finally had to take a break, and Ron started singing now about Jesus, and telling people over the microphone about Jesus. From the back of the crowd, a man yelled out, told him, you better shut up or I'm going to cut you, and Ron said, I, I just didn't feel that I should stop, and he kept on preaching, kept on singing. Sure enough, this man smashed a quart bottle of beer and came with the intention of cutting him. And on the way up, a man saw him coming up and swung and knocked him out. <laughs> Again, in a small town, word spread, what's happened to Ron? Ron has become a Jesus freak. My parents come in January of 1970 in late February, perhaps early March, he had a revival with this man that I've told you about several times, John Metzler. Very powerful revival. People are getting saved. God's doing a miracle. Ron's uncle had started attending church, and so he left a flyer out for Ron to see it, and on the last couple nights of revival, Ron and Susie came. Get a picture here of the uh, Ron, around this time, this is Ron. I think his hair was actually a bit longer uh, when he came to church. But this is how he looked. And unlike the other church that, first of all, hassled you about your hair, my dad welcomed them. Now, I want you to understand this. My dad was nothing like hippies. There's not a single hippie who would come in and like, wow, he's one of us, Right? <laughs> But it didn't matter, my dad welcomed them. Began talking with Ron, Ron was telling about how he's, how he's witnessing to people, having Bible studies, and Ron and Susie were very generous as they often would feed uh, the people that would come to their house. And so after the revival, when it finished, my dad found out where they lived and showed up at their house with a couple of sacks of groceries. Said, this is just to help you when you're uh, witnessing to people, that really made impact on Ron and Susie, and so they started coming to our church. They were the first hippies in our church, the very first ones that we had, and they witnessed to everyone and started inviting them. Numbers of their friends and their family got saved. A few months later, uh, witnessed to uh, Ron's cousin, Patty Harris, and Patty got saved. And then a short time later, her husband, Jack, he was the one in the car with him, scoring drugs when Ron got saved. Jack and Patty now came in. And my dad also welcomed them, not worrying about what they looked like. He was glad that they got saved. So here's a lesson. I want to stop. This is a lesson for all of us. And that lesson has to do with welcoming those who God brings. Luke 15, 1 and 2. Who has that? There's no scripture? Oh, we don't have it. Scribal error. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. 
the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Okay, so sinners are drawn to Jesus and religious people are complaining. You see how things never change. So here's the question. Many of you have been praying for revival. We're praying, God, give us national revival. God, give us revival in our city. God, give us revival in our church. Okay, if God brings people who are nothing like you, if you're praying for revival, are you actually saying, God, please bring people who look like me, think like me, vote like me? What happens if they don't? What happens if they look wild and crazy? What happens if their beliefs, their politics are nothing like yours? Are you going to accept them? Because that's what built our church. Or are you going to reject that? Look at them. Because you can miss, there were churches all across America that missed because they would not welcome people when God gave them. Jack Harris began to uh, witness to people the moment he got saved, God did a miracle in him. He actually contacted a bunch of his family and friends and invited them over to another relative's house and he was going to tell them and explain how he had become a Jesus freak. Young girl named Janet Payson. Now she's Janet Foley. She's 15 years old. Her and her boyfriend were going to go out to a party that night. But her boyfriend, I don't know if he was a relative or a friend, somehow had gotten an invitation from Jack to come. And so he said to his girlfriend, Janet, would you mind, before we go to the party, would you mind if we went to Chino? Jack wants to tell us how he became a Jesus freak. And so... A crowd of people are gathered in the house and Jack told them his testimony interspersed with playing tracks from King Crimson. Here's an <laughs> here's a outreach tool there. And, and Janet said, <clears throat> what he told them was, look, it's only been two weeks since I got saved. I can't explain what happened to me except that I am so different, I can't even cuss anymore. Jesus has changed me. And he invited them all to come to church. On a Sunday morning, <clears throat> uh, a man named Roger Skinner, he had a license, he could drive. Roger Skinner brought Janet, her boyfriend, and Janet's best friend, Emily Yaw, and all four of them got saved. And immediately when they got saved, this is what God was doing. People got saved and immediately started to witness. Three weeks after they got saved, it was the county fair. And we had a booth at the county fair. This is one of the first ones we ever did. And because drugs were now causing problems in the community, and this was quite new, we did, our booth was on drug awareness. And so... Young people were there, they're witnessing, and uh, some of them were preaching. Somebody called the police, and four of them got arrested. And this hit the paper. Uh, here's the actual uh, newspaper article, case dismissed against youths in the fair incident. You see in the picture there, three of the four. That's Ron Jones, Norm Kennedy, Emily Yaw. So Emily is a high schooler. And so the word of this spread. This is connected. Ron Burrell is different. Jack Harris is different. What is going on at the Foursquare Church? And Janet said, people began asking what was happening. And they were able to have Bible studies. They were able to witness and tell people about Jesus. She said, everybody seemed so open and people started coming to church and getting saved. Around this time, parents started getting very worried about what was happening with their kids, and so they started spreading rumors, don't go to the Foursquare Church, they pass out drugs in the offering. <laughs> Do you think that kept, kept kids away? <laughs> and so in the high school, in Prescott High School, where Janet went, at one time, we had more than 50 kids who were saved and coming to church at one time. That was just a part of, of 
what God was doing. And so this was the, the, the beginnings of our church. Remember, I've told you in the previous lessons, my father was frustrated because he and my mom were converts. All they wanted to see was sinners get saved. And he's been trying to play church games. It's very frustrating. And now in the Jesus movement, exactly what my parents wanted to see started happening. And every single service, people start getting saved powerfully. The word is spreading. Young people start coming in. This was the original basis of our church and uh, that little building there that only seated 65, uh, very quickly we were running 130 people, 150 people, absolutely jam-packed. Uh, Bob and Sharon were telling me that when, she, because there were so few seats, young people would fill the entire altar space all the way up. Said when Sharon went up to play the organ, she could not get off. She had to stay there through the whole service because you simply couldn't move. And in there, this tiny little building, next week we'll talk about a man named Larry Reed who came and in this tiny building, he would get people, they would start jumping and, and they thought the whole building was gonna collapse. But this is the, the, the birthplace of our church. It was birthed in the Jesus movement. So we're gonna talk about this in the next lesson We'll talk about music and, and how we begin to use music for revival. But this is what God did in our church is a miracle. We are founded on conversions. When we look back, these are lessons we have to make sure, are we still wanting sinners? Is that still your heart? Are we still willing to welcome Sinners, they won't look like they did in the 60s or 70s probably. But are you going to open your heart if God brings the very thing that we've been praying for? And that's why we have to look at the memorial stones and see what God has been doing. Isn't that wonderful? When we look back and see what God's doing, what a, what a miracle in uh, just seeing that God is in charge. You know, we need to praise God. We need to thank God for his goodness. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you that you allow us to be a part of what you're doing, Lord God. I'm grateful for your faithfulness. Praise God. Amen. Then in the next lesson, as I said, we'll, we'll move on. There's uh, uh, many things that began to be foundational, things that we do to this day and they are connected to our history. Praise God. We're going to stop there, and our service will start at 1030. God bless you.